The Wills question from July 2003 is a standard issue Wills question. This is an excellent way to sharpen your skills, going over a lot of the same issues that the California Bar chooses to test over and over again. Have a look at the call of the question. What rights, if any, do Al, Carl, Norm, Deb, Eve, and SU have in Tom's estate? Discuss. Six potential claimants. Well, in order to answer this call of the question, we've got to first establish whether there's a controlling document, second, organize our analysis around either these six possible beneficiaries or around some items of property, and then, finally, offer a straight answer to the question presented, applying California law. Finally, we're going to have to indicate who gets what. Go to the top of the question, and you see in these six short paragraphs, we find out a lot of details. Paragraph one is the longest paragraph, and it indicates that the first document, the 1998 will, is valid, and it gives us these four dispositive provisions. 100000 to Al, residence on Elm Street to Beth, Megacorp stock to Carl, and the residue to State University. Fair enough. In paragraph two, we find out that in 1999, Tom, our testator, had a falling out with his friend Al. So, in 1999, Tom executes a valid codicil that expressly revokes paragraph one and makes no other changes. Okay, let's pause. So far we've seen two documents, and both of them are valid. So, we will just go through a chronology as we establish the governing documents. Now, take a look at paragraph 3. Here, in 2000, there is a reconciliation between testator and Al, and he tells several people, Al doesn't need to worry, I've provided for it. Well, what effect do those oral statements have on any distribution of Tom's estate? Answer, you'd be surprised how much, potentially. Take a look at the next paragraph. In 2001, Beth died in test date. But she's got one surviving child and two grandchildren who are themselves children of a predeceased child of Beth. So clearly we're going to have to go into lapse and anti-lapse. And in paragraph four, we also find out that Tom sold his Omega Corp stock and reinvested the proceeds by purchasing Alpha Corp stock. So, with regard to the stock, we're going to have to consider issues of ademption. Again, notice how, although we are seeing quite a few issues, none of them are terribly difficult. So, once again, this is going to boil down to careful organization. If we organize carefully, it'll be easy to write an effective answer to this question. Go to paragraph 5. Here, Tom dies in 2002. The will and codicil are found in his safety deposit box. The will is unmarked, but the codicil has the words null and void written across the text of the codicil in Tom's handwriting, followed by Tom's signature. So, paragraph 5 will further complicate our analysis about which document will govern. Finally, in paragraph 6, we find out who is still alive after Tom dies. Al, Carl, Norm, Deb, and Eve. And at the time of Tom's death, his estate consisted of 100000 in cash, the Elm Street residence, and the Alpha Corp stock. And then we get the call of the question again. Well, turn the page and have a look at the outline of issues that I present. And you'll see that I don't do anything tricky here. With regard to validity, I just go through the chronology. In 1998, he wrote a will, and there's very little to talk about there because it's just valid. Similarly, in 1999, he created this codicil, which we also are told was valid. But then, we have to go into the analysis about revocation. Notice that the law being tested here isn't really very complicated, but we have to go through chronologically. I talk about the two different ways this codicil might have been revoked, either by physical act or by a holographic codicil. I comment on Tom's statements in 2000, and my conclusion, ultimately, is that the codicil was revoked by physical act, 
and the will from 1998 is going to govern this estate. Then we turn to distribution and you'll see I organize around the items of property. It seems easier to do that than to organize around the parties. However, if you chose to organize around the parties, I think that's entirely satisfactory too. For my way of thinking, that would be a much clumsier way to go about it, but I can certainly understand the many people I personally met who found it intuitively easier to organize this question around the individuals rather than around the property. Now, very briefly, have a look at the model answer that I offer to this question. And you'll see, once again, that the key to doing a really effective job on this not terribly difficult question is to organize your answer well. And that is not necessarily easy. You have to have a good understanding of the basic approach to wills in order to come up with a good framework like this one that allows us to find a home for every fact in the pattern. In a legal context, that makes sense. So, Go to part one and have a look at the way that I have organized my analysis of the validity of Tom's will. Notice that I lead with the facts about his death and how in order to figure out distribution we have to come to a conclusion with regard to which documents will govern that distribution. And then I just go through chronologically and notice how at each step of the analysis the 1998 will, the 1999 codicil, and then each of the uh, revocation analysis steps, I'm basically just focusing on what happened. There's plenty of law in this part of the answer, but you'll notice that it is analysis heavy. I focus very clearly on what happened and on what it means legally. So, basically, with regard to the revocation analysis, from the beginning, I am sympathetic to the testator's efforts to revoke that codicil. And it seems to me that the testator's physical act of writing null and void across that document should be good enough to revoke that document. But notice, I also go into the holographic codicil analysis, and I get into a fair amount of black letter law. Basically, what Tom did here isn't quite good enough to satisfy California's requirements for a valid holograph. But as you make your way through my analysis, I think you'll find that I present a persuasive case for the conclusion that Tom's 1999 codicil is revoked, and also that Tom's clear intent was for his original 1998 will to govern the distribution of his estate. Fair enough. Now turn to my analysis on how we actually should distribute Tom's estate. And here, it seems to me the easiest way to do it is to just go through the line items of the will. So, first I start off with the $100,000 gift to Al in paragraph 1. It's apparent that Tom's real intent was for Al to receive this money, and I conclude that he gets it. Discussing the Elm Street residence requires us to apply a fairly complicated aspect of California wills and trusts law, and that is lapse and anti-lapse. Take a look at the first paragraph within lapse and anti-lapse at the bottom of page 2 and then the first paragraph on the top of page 3. You'll notice that I get into a fair amount of black letter law and detail and I very specifically apply that law to the facts in the question. So, Norm gets half of this residence. Deb and Eve split the other half according to California law. With regard to the Omega Corp stock in paragraph 3, as I indicated earlier, we need to get into the details with regard to Ademption. And this is a situation where we've got the first stock, the Mega Corp stock, which is no longer in the estate at the time of Tom's death. Instead, Alpha stock is present. What happened was Tom sold the Omega Corp stock and reinvested the proceeds in Alpha Corp stock. So, we've got a specific device that isn't present in the estate at the time of death. So, we would indicate that it would be deemed by extinction. Now, Carl obviously is going to argue that the gift shouldn't be deemed because Tom clearly intended him to benefit. Now, 
This is an area where I think reasonable people can and do differ. A strict application of California redemption principles would put the Alpha Corp stock in the residuary, uh, and they would take, or SU would take. A lot of people who passed this question arrived at that conclusion. It seems to me that the more just re uh, result is to give Carl the stock. That's my conclusion. Finally, we turn to the residue. That goes to State University. And the analysis that I present suggests that SU is not going to get anything important from this estate. If the gift to Carl were redeemed, SU would, re would receive the Alpha Corp stock. So I acknowledge that State University may in fact have a valid claim to this stock. But I think the better result is to give it to Carl. So I conclude Al takes the 100000 gift, Norm gets half the residence, Deb and Eve split the other half, Carl gets the stock, and SU gets anything else that's left in Tom's estate. And that wraps up a consideration of what I think you'll agree is a fairly straightforward Will's question.